Hi, I'm Tom Gleason from the University of Victoria. And today I'm asking the question, is groundwater a local or global resource? It's a great honor to be the Halibuti uh, lecture for this year. I'm speaking to you from University of Victoria and on the West Coast. Normally I'm a pretty casual West Coast kind of guy, but I decided to dress up today. I have an alter ego called Dr. H2O. So I'm coming at you as Dr. H2O. I love sharing and interaction as you can see at the bottom of this uh, image. And today what we're gonna explore is uh, lots of ideas inspired by a quote that I find very inspiring from Gandhi, that the earth provides enough for every human's needs, but not every human's greed. So with that quote in mind, I wanna move forward and, and tell you a little bit more about myself very quickly, and then what you're gonna get out of today's talk. So since we're um, uh, all at the Geological Society of America, I mean, a good audience that understands the Earth system, and I wanted to place myself within the Earth system. I, I'm really a hydrologist. I focus on the hydrosphere and the hydrologic cycle. And specifically, I, my, myself, my research group and collaborators work on multi-scale and multidisciplinary hydrogeology. But one of the things that we bring to hydrogeology is not just moving across scale, as you'll see today, but we also always integrate humans. So we bring the anthrosphere into that as well. So my research group is called Groundwater Science and Sustainability, bringing these two themes together. And you'll see this through today's talk. So overall, I just wanna welcome you to the fabulous Anthropocene. This is kind of a positive and forward-looking message that I hope you'll get through today's talk. We see it here a lot of doom and gloom and challenge, and there are lots of challenges in today's world, but I want, I want to highlight a uh, positive energy uh, bringing that forward. And that positive energy I'll bring forward is through three key messages. And these are the three kind of takeaways from for today's talk. The first is I want to, to kind of give you a different approach to how we examine um, groundwater. So I'm going to talk about how we examine groundwater globally and using sustainability science and how that, that's complementary to local studies and local groundwater resource um, evaluations. The second key message is much more small scale. I'm going to show you uh, our, some recent work that we've done in my research group and with collaborators about uh, these new tools called analytical depletion functions. And they provide a rapid screening level uh, estimates of stream flow depletion. Um, that's really important for water managers and as you'll see for, for salmon and that's why and other fish ecosystems as, uh, and that's why I'm showing this fish here. The third and this is what I'll round out with is more about this fabulous Anthropocene like the future of groundwater science and sustainability as an exciting corner of global change research. So I'm going to start with that first question and really what I started with uh, today is, is there a global groundwater problem? There's been a whole series of discussions and papers and review papers about this. Um, this is an image from a paper I published in, in 2012. This is uh, estimating groundwater footprints from uh, all the major aquifers around the world. We just uh, led a really great uh, Chapman conference last year about the quest of sustainability and at regional to global scales for highly stressed aquifers. But it's important to remember what a global problem is, and this kind of gets at the root of this question. So a global problem is any issue that adversely affects the global community and environment, such as the environmental issues, political crises, social issues, or economic crises. We're in a number of those kind of colliding right now, I would argue. Um, and, and solutions to global problems or global issues generally require cooperation between nations. So on, on one level, um, there's a lot of doubt whether groundwater is a, a truly global problem. You can think of, um, there's a, a, a graph here to kind of represent this thinking of problems. So on the x-axis is uh, our global sustainability goals. So these are the UN sustainable development goals. And on the y-axis is this groundwater stress that I was just talking about. So different aquifers have different characteristics. Some may be like in the top left corner of this graphic, they may be in the global south with significant groundwater depletion. Whereas other aquifers may be in the global north. They've met many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but um, they have um, significant groundwater depletion. The High Plains Aquifer would be an example of this. 
And so there are massive differences between different aquifers in different places. And so that's what's led Foster and a number of other people to argue that groundwater resources have important local characteristics in hydrology, politics, law, and cultures. And I definitely agree with that. And I think there are a number of different scales that are important. So a different way of asking that same question is, what are the most appropriate scales for groundwater systems, resources, and sustainability? And I would argue that all scales are important. That's kind of like a, a loose and easy way to get out of the question, saying everything's important. But I do really feel that way. I, I feel like from a, a city scale to an aquifer scale to a national scale to an, uh, a pan-national scale for organizations such as the European Union and to the global scale are all important for groundwater sustainability. And I'm gonna highlight in the next few slides, five reasons why this global scale perspective, which is a little bit newer in the groundwater resource community, is important because often we already still think about aquifers at a local scale. So by, by talking through these five different reasons, I don't want to get the wrong message that these regional or local scale studies are not important. All scales are important. So the first reason that um, uh, a global perspective on groundwater is useful is that it places groundwater, which is a, a critical resource, many of us know and, and would agree on, in global sustainability frameworks. So on the left-hand side here is the planetary boundaries framework, and groundwater is absolutely unrepresented in that currently uh, as, it's, it, as it stands. This, the second framework that I've already alluded to is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Also, groundwater is very underrepresented here, even though we know that groundwater is important for growing food, for uh, water resources, and for a number of different other goals that are wrapped up in the UN SDGs. So a global perspective could place groundwater in these global frameworks that policymakers and governments prioritize. The second, um, from an Earth system perspective, is this global perspective often helps to understand and quantify how groundwater is connected or not and where to other earth systems. So here uh, in this paper, it was led by a, a co-author, uh, Mark Cuthbert. We quantified groundwater climate interactions and highlighted that there's two fundamental types of interactions, unidirectional and bidirectional groundwater interactions. And by doing that, we we're able to assess the spatial and temporal aspects of groundwater climate interactions. Other people have uh, studied groundwater in the deeper earth processes or groundwater uh, in the ocean and, and submarine groundwater discharge. So these are just examples of how this global perspective is useful for a better understanding of our earth system overall. The third reason is uh, uh, to take this global perspective is to inform water governance for large and often transboundary groundwater systems. And an example of that is a paper written by uh, Carol Dalin, who I've uh, shown here in a, in a photo, where she highlighted and uh, assessed how groundwater depletion, so that's overuse of um, groundwater in a specific region, actually is transported via virtual water trade to other regions. So um, the consumption of um, food and other products in the United States or in Canada is causing groundwater depletion in India or China and other countries. So by taking an only regional perspective, we can't understand these important drivers of the groundwater depletion in a global changing world. The fourth reason to care is to be able to analyze systems regardless of their local context. So this is a paper that I was part of led by uh, Inga de Graaf um, from Freiburg. And uh, Inga uh, analyzed the environmental, the times to the environmental flow thresholds in rivers. And she was able to do this consistently across the globe and highlight the importance of uh, and problem of groundwater pumping and how that will impact environmental flows now and, and over the coming decades. And she was able to do that consistently across the globe and, and that allows us to uh, prioritize different regions, uh, potentially for knowledge transfer or a better understanding systematically of systems and problems across the world. The fifth reason to take this global perspective is to create visualizations. A number of papers that I've been involved with, I think the, the most important 
aspect is actually uh, giving people something to, to see and, and to look at. So here's a paper of uh, modern groundwater, the distribution of uh, the depth of modern groundwater. Um, and that global map is nice, but what a lot of people um, I've found have caught on to is actually just a, a much simpler figure of our of water drops. So this is a representation of uh, water drop. So the, all the older groundwater is, is shown in the smaller or the larger water drop. And the modern groundwater that's less than 50 years old is in this very small water drop. And so if we take these, air, another way to visualize this is if we take the if we take all this water and, and spread it over the continents of the earth, the modern groundwater would be the equivalent to the height of the tallest person ever um, uh, recorded. And the, all, the, all the older groundwater would be equivalent to the height of the Empire State Building. So by assessing groundwater globally, we can develop these visualizations, which may lead to people understanding and appreciating groundwater more. So that's my pitch for thinking about groundwater more globally, while also thinking about groundwater regionally and locally. So this, this science of groundwater sustainability has evolved, and I wanna highlight some, some evolution of where it's been and where it's going. Um, in the, from the early air days of our, of our field in the 1930s to I would say all the way to the 1990s, we were focused really on what I would call groundwater resource sustainability. This is uh, uh, shown uh, uh, by uh, groundbreaking work by Tice and, and many others uh, around what happens when we pump a well, um, how we optimize field tests and how we supply water. Then um, in the 1990s and, and, and to present, we've really come to this reckoning that groundwater and surface water are always and often interconnected. Um, so we can think of this as connected groundwater, surface water sustainability and uh, where ecology is important. And then more recently in the last 10 years, and, and this is roots to, to deeper papers as well, um, we really put groundwater within this sustainable development uh, framework that I've, I've already alluded to. So what this, uh, and that brings in economic, environmental and social aspects into groundwater sustainability. So this evolution is challenging in that it keeps getting more and more complicated, but also more interesting. So we have more and more disciplines being involved and we have um, more and more complexity of scope and optimization as we move up in this um, inverted triangle. So most recently, I've come to recognize some differences in the fundamental definitions of groundwater sustainability. Most previous definitions of groundwater sustainability were actually what is called in the sustainability literature, weak sustainability. And in weak sustainability, all forms of capital, whether they're natural or human are interchangeable. So what that means from a groundwater perspective is that depletion or contamination and ecosystem impacts can be balanced by economic growth. That's often what we, that's kind of the dialogue that we often hear when we think about groundwater and groundwater sustainability. For strong sustainability, and we have a monkey with the, the big uh, biceps here, different forms of capital are not always interchangeable. So in, in a groundwater context, that might mean that depletion, contamination, and ecosystem impacts are not always balanced by economic growth. So all previous definitions of groundwater sustainability, including a, a few of my own, um, have had this ambiguous balancing of the environment, economy, and society, society in a weak sustainability framework. And so what that does is it um, can undermine our efforts to create truly, truly sustainable groundwater systems. So very recently in the last couple of years, I've worked with a number of colleagues to develop uh, a new definition of groundwater sustainability. And that new definition of groundwater sustainability includes an aspect of what we call physical groundwater sustainability. And a second aspect, which isn't highlighted here, of groundwater governance and management, and a third aspect around groundwater services, what groundwater does for us. And since we're uh, primarily earth scientists, I'm going to focus on that um, physical groundwater sustainability. And what we mean by that is uh, shown in this graph here. Uh, on the x-axis, we're moving through time, and on the y-axis is groundwater levels, um, flows, or quality. And so uh, physical groundwater sustain sustainability means maintaining dynamically stable groundwater levels, flows, and quality 
So through time, we can have uh, we, water levels or quality will change, but over time, we're maintaining a, a consistent level. Uh, and we've also described how that um, contrasts with what can be called either strategic aquifer depletion, SAD, or manage aquifer depletion, MAD, uh, but I don't have time uh, in today's talk to really get into this. For more details, you can see a review paper uh, in Earth and Planetary, uh, reviews for Earth and Planetary Sciences that I um, led uh, last year. So we've brought this um, definition to uh, a new call to action, which came out of the uh, Chapman conference that I mentioned earlier. This has been signed by uh, over uh, a thousand people in, in a hundred different countries. And you can check it out uh, by, uh, on your own. And, and if you're interested, um, sign it. It's a global call to action around groundwater sustainability. So that's our, our kind of global perspective on groundwater. I wanna zoom in to a more local scale because I know a number of people appreciate understanding and, and tools for local scale hydrology. So in this uh, work, I'm, uh, I'm working uh, as I did in the, uh, the previous um, slides with a number of people. Um, so here are some of the uh, postdocs and, and collaborators and partners that I've worked with and a number of different uh, organizations and, and institutions. And what we're really trying to develop is uh, new tools for uh, assessing stream flow depletion. I'm gonna um, define what I mean by stream flow depletion uh, here. So stream flow dep depletion is the capture of stream flow by pumping. So on the, the image that you see here, we have a well drilled into a, an aquifer that's connected to a stream and that um, two things happen when we pump that well. The first is that we have groundwater depletion. Groundwater depletion is uh, the, lower, uh, the systematic lowering of the water table that leads to a loss of storage in aquifers. And that is shown in the, the red line here on this graph on the right. So this is a graph of on the x-axis, the, the time since the start of pumping and on the y-axis, the source of pumped groundwater. So we can see that the percentage of groundwater depletion um, decreases through time as we continue to pump uh, well. The opposite happens to stream flow depletion. This is this um, capture of um, stream flow that was either intended to be going to the stream as groundwater discharge or actual infiltration of um, stream flow into the uh, aquifer. And so stream flow depletion increases with time uh, as through pumping. And so over long time scales, stream flow depletion is the primary source of water pumped to wells. And what makes this research um, even more important is that stream flow depletion um, is important for a number of different reasons. The first is that um, cool the flux of groundwater is important to a number of uh, river and lake and wetland ecosystems. It supports sal salmon uh, stocks in British Columbia, where I'm from, for example. Also, um, stream flow and stream flow depletion is important to people. And the last in the bottom left is showing the, the parliament uh, near where I live in Victoria here. And groundwater is also important for laws. And a specific example of that is the BC Water Sustainability Act, which for the first time links groundwater pumping and environmental flows. So this is the flow of water we need in a river. And I'm doing this research in BC and a couple other jurisdictions, as you'll see. Um, so, and the, the same can be said for Sigma in uh, California, for example. It's a new act that um, makes this connection between groundwater and surface water and makes these tools um, important to develop. So overall, the problem that we're trying to address here is how can water managers quantify stream flow depletion with limited time, budget, or resources? Previous work on this question um, was conducted by, um, in Michigan and in uh, California on the left-hand side here. It's great work um, by Howard uh, Reeves at the USGS, who developed and really inspired our work here, comparing numerical mod flow models with analytical solutions. He used the inverse distance to stream to in a water uh, decisions uh, tool for Michigan. Uh, another work in a, a small valley in Northern California uh, by uh, Laura Foglia and others at um, UC Davis uh, explored the role of numerical models 
in these uh, types of systems connected of, between groundwater and surface water and, and surface water pumping, or sorry, groundwater pumping. So just a little bit more background about how we quantify stream flow depletion. Unfortunately, even though we're all scientists, um, we can't actually measure directly stream flow depletion. In the real world, we have a, a stream network often with very few gauges. So what we usually do is quantify stream flow depletion either with what's shown on the left-hand side, analytical models, which are very simple, uh, uh, mathematically exact equations, which have uh, a number of assumptions, or on the right-hand side, uh, numerical models, which are much more realistic, but they have significant time and effort. So the research here is to try to find something in between. And so our objective is to develop analytical approaches, so these fast, easy to implement approaches that account for the complex geometry that we actually see in streams. So if we imagine we uh, pump a well, we have this red dot shown in a, in a real watershed, um, and it's, it's possibly impacting a whole number of different streams, we first would want to pick um, which streams it might be possibly Im impacting. We call that um, a stream proximity criteria. The second um, aspect of uh, determining the impact of groundwater pumping on these streams is what we call a depletion apportionment equation. So this apportions the depletion to specific steam, stream reaches. And the third is the analytical model itself, which calculates the groundwater depletion through time as a percentage of pumping through the well. So we combine these three tools into a new tool that we call analytical depletion functions. And we've uh, developed over 50 of these combinations of these three components of analytical depletion functions. And today I'm just gonna show you the best, uh, but you can, uh, the best performing, I guess I should say. But you can see uh, many more details of these in, in a series of papers that I'll provide references to. So a little, just a little bit more detail about these three different components. The first, um, stream proximity criteria that we use and is the best performing is um, what we call adjacent and expanding. So it finds the, the streams that are adjacent and then expands through time as you would expect from pumping. Then we um, apply what we used to call the spider method, but now we call it the web squared. Um, and that's that apportions the stream flow to um, a series of stream reaches. And then we apply uh, and the analytical model, in this case, um, the hunt function, which has been uh, well documented. So this was work uh, completed by um, Sam Zipper, now at the Kansas Geological Survey, and he tested 50 different combinations. And what we're really asking here is which, uh, how complicated does a tool have to be to really work? So this is, we used the same tools as uh, I previously talked about in Michigan and then developed these new tools for stream geometry and, and, and compared these simple to complex solutions. We first did this in uh, Vancouver Island, is in watersheds nearby Victoria here, in three different domains with three different drainage densities, because we knew that drainage density uh, might be uh, uh, impacting the performance of these different solutions. We developed a numerical model in ModFlow, and that's what we compared our analytical depletion functions to. So we're fully in model land here. Uh, we're, we're comparing a numerical model to an analytical model. What we found was that the solutions work pretty well. Um, so here's an image of um, uh, depletion percentage or depletion fraction. We pumped each well systematically through um, dozens and dozens of wells in each of these domains with different um, drainage densities, comparing mod flow and web squared. And we um, analyzed um, which worked best. And then we moved to a slightly more complicated um, watershed. Uh, this is a, a subsequent work in uh, California. This is in the Navarro watershed in uh, Northern California. Again, we uh, in, uh, made a numerical model and pumped um, synthetic wells. So we, we placed fake wells throughout um, the domain, pumped these wells and compared 
the analytical depletion functions to the numerical model. So overall, the, this graph shows the analytical depletion uh, 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 function versus the mod flow uh, model on the X and Y axis. And overall, the comparison is good. Um, the, generally, we find that large errors are overestimates in depletion for the analytical depletion functions, which means that this is overall an environmentally conservative tool. So this is useful for, for water managers. And we also found uh, that the, the spatial distribution of primary impact was, was consistent. So here on this graph, um, through time, what we see is that the analytical depletion functions captured the right um, stream um, over 75% of the time through time. So overall, these analytical depletion functions seem to work. They are uh, very good at studying and, and, and quantifying the primary impacts, or the most impacted reach, and the flux at those most impacted reach. Um, where, we, where we're continuing to work is how these solutions work for cumulative pumping and uh, for more complex hydrostratigraphy. But overall, we feel like we've developed uh, a low data requirement tool, which can be used very quickly. Um, uh, we provided R scripts for uh, a number of these different tools which are being implemented. And we're also, uh, a lot of this work has been funded by a, a partnership with uh, a, a water tech company called uh, Foundry Spatial that makes decision support tools. And so the next phase of this work is fully integrating these analytical depletion functions into these decision support tools. So what we imagine here is being able to ask questions like this, which streams will be depleted by a new irrigator and by how much? How can we balance the needs of water users and ecosystems? What are the unimpaired current flows in the stream? And how much water is there and how much water can be allocated? So we're hoping to and have initial prototypes already of integrating these new analytical depletion functions into these water management tools for water managers in British Columbia and uh, hopefully soon in California. So this work has been a series of papers in, in WRR and uh, Journal of Hydrology, as well as this um, R package, which is available uh, to anyone called St Stream Depleter can be downloaded and played with, and we're happy to support uh, how this work um, gets rolled out. And this work really was led by um, Sam uh, Zipper at the Kansas Geological Survey. So I also wanted to acknowledge that he's the, co the main author of this R package and these um, papers, and, and he is also a really useful source of information if someone would like to apply this. I'm going to end today's talk with the third core message about moving forward with groundwater sustainability in our fabulous Anthropocene era. These are uh, a series of forward-looking ideas from the same um, review paper in Earth and Planetary Sciences. So what we see, uh, the first thing we see is the possibility of moving towards long-term management. We all know that groundwater is a very slow and, and long resource. It takes a very long time to move in through aquifers and many systems. So on this graph here on the horizontal axis, I've uh, placed uh, today and then way off on the, on the far side of the horizontal axis, multiple generations. So I see in some way that we need to think very long, well past the gray bar here, which is typical management horizons of five to 20 years. And we need to think about groundwater sustainability in those long time scales. Um, and we need to manage and set goals. So if we imagine setting a groundwater sustainability goal for 50 or 100 years from now for groundwater levels, flow or quality, that's the Y axis, then we can actually backcast to the present to figure out what we need to do to get there. So what backcasting means is setting a future goal and looking back at the present to figure out how to get there. And that's one tool that I can imagine along with adaptive management for long-term management of aquifers. 
Second kind of big idea um, moving forward might be placing groundwater and considering it as a global commons. So there's a significant literature out there on common pool resources across different scales. And generally, groundwater has been under theorized in this area. So we, we can think differently about groundwater as a global commons and, and what the ethical dimensions of what that could mean. The third place that groundwater sustainability may go in the coming years is to focus more explicitly on global groundwater governance. There are a number of different projects um, and uh, working groups around this in, uh, in the United Nations and the uh, International Association for Hydrology and other groups and a number of different books um, recently that I've highlighted here, all of which are pointing to this importance of groundwater management and governance in uh, at both the local and regional scale, but also at the national and international scale. So that may be a, a, a movement we see. Another area where we may see um, a moving uh, movement towards is what I call groundwater sustainability simulators or decision support tools. So I've shown here a, a kind of a military application of a, of a simulator, but I can imagine a group of um, water managers sitting in a uh, decision support room with an amazing tool in their hands. And that tool brings together hydrologic models such as ModFlow or others um, that can integrate all the earth system aspects that we talked about it, may, it would integrate economic models, land use models, with possibly agent-based models uh, to uh, simulate how real agents make decisions about uh, groundwater sustainability. So I can imagine a, a place where um, we run scenarios about different aspects of these very complicated interconnecting systems. And we um, are, can interact with these um, simulators to assess the complex dynamics which are necessary to lead towards greater ground, groundwater sustainability. The next area that I think we're moving towards already is bringing earth systems and sustainability discussions together. I highlighted that um, early in this um, conversation. These are uh, an image again from this review paper where uh, I'm bringing the earth system perspective to groundwater hydrology but I think that really needs to be paired with a sustainability perspective. And together, this scientific perspective on groundwater hydrology and sustainability science can help us better integrate groundwater into these global sustainability frameworks. That I said very early on, they were poorly represented in the current global sustainability framework, such as the planetary boundaries or the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The last place that I would love uh, my discipline to move towards, hydrogeology, is a perspective of what I call the good Anthropocene, or, uh, uh, and what I would like to call the good Anthropocene. This is an idea that was developed by Elena Bedet and others, where instead of thinking about the dystopian futures um, that, are, that lead to inaction um, about what sustainability challenges, we actually plant seeds now of a future that we want um, later. So we think very positively and proactively about what we can do now to create a, a better or a good Anthropocene. One of the very small ways you can do that is by um, checking out our uh, call to action. This is a, a way of um, a, a single first step of, of planting a seed towards this good Anthropocene for groundwater. I just want to thank you for your attention here. And if you're interested in any more uh, information and, and joining the conversation, I'm on Twitter uh, at Water Underground or Foundry Spatial that I mentioned earlier uh, that develops the water decision support tools. I am also a uh, leader of a uh, global collective of groundwater nerds that run a blog called uh, the Water Underground blog. You can check out uh, that or the websites of uh, my Groundwater Science and Sustainability Research Group or uh, Foundry Spatial. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to the discussion and any questions.